As the sticker in the rear window of this car alludes to, life is just too short to drive boring cars. And that's an adage which I've always applied to buying my own vehicles, this one included. Because believe it or not, this is actually my current daily driver. A 1966 Ford Country Sedan. Bit of a strange name, I think, calling it the Sedan when it's clearly a wagon. And although it's technically a Galaxy, it doesn't seem to be referred to by Ford as the Galaxy, at least as far as I can tell. Now, if you compare it side by side, it's pretty obvious that it is a Galaxy, just as a wagon, whereas the Galaxy itself seems to be more so the Ford or Sedan, the Coupe, and the open top, the convertible. Now, the Galaxy itself was a replacement to the far better known Ford Fairlane. Very well known name. I'm not a huge Ford guy myself. I'm more of like an old school Plymouth and Cadillac kind of guy. But it would seem that I am a Ford fan because between this and the Lincoln, both of my cars are Ford products in one way or another. Now, in the case of this one, there are a couple of different engine trims, or at least there were back in the day, and probably there aren't so many of them around anymore. But just for this model year alone, in 1966, they built over 92,000 of these cars. So these were everywhere back in the day. Here in the UK now though, as far as I know, there are two of these. So it is one of the rarest cars on UK roads, so if you do see this thing driving around, it's pretty much guaranteed to be me. The other one probably doesn't have a paint job that looks anything like this anyway. So between this and my Lincoln, of which there are also only two in the UK, I've got some pretty recognisable cars. Now, in the case of these country sedans, there seem to be three primary different V8 options. There's a 289, which is what I've got here. That's a 4.7 litre V8. There's a 350, which of course is around what, 5.7, I believe. And then there's a 390. And the 390 tends to get most of the attention online at least in terms of chatter, which is understandable. You know, biggest tends to be best with older engines. But I will say, even though, of course, it's not a performance trim or even a performance car, it's very much so a workhorse, a family car, that was the whole point. It's not slow, actually. Now, the projected performance, although I haven't, you know, GPS timed it myself, is only estimated to be in about the 12, 13 second or so, not to 60 range. Top speed isn't much better than 100 miles an hour. And of course, it's not helped by the three speed auto gearbox. And incidentally, they did have these with both auto and manual options with both three and four speeds. So there were quite a few options in there, and there were some that had more or less seats than others. In the case of mine, I've got three in the front, three behind, and then four hidden seats in the trunk as well, like old Land Rover style, which I absolutely love, because sometimes for car shows or trips to the beach, I love to take my extended family in there. Having six seats in the Lincoln is already fantastic, but having eight or ten in this one is, of course, even better. Not to mention the fantastic loading space, which I've already made good use of as well to shift some larger stuff that didn't fit in the other cars. Now, in terms of the engine, being a 4.7 by UK standards is quite big. In the States, not so much. There did seem to be a bit of contradiction between certain different sites and even within certain sites as to what exactly this V8 is. Some places seem to say it was a Challenger V8, no relation to Dodge, and others said it was a Windsor V8, which of course is far better known for Ford. Now, either way, I think, and I could be mistaken again, but I believe this engine block might have been shared with some of the early Mustangs. And for any aficionados who know otherwise, feel free to correct me below, but it certainly seems like it could be that engine base, albeit in a less powerful form, and that would make a lot of sense, of course, a lot of engines were shared back then. In terms of the spec, it's not a slouch, it is a pre-fuel crisis car, so even though it's only a 4.7, it still puts out more power than like a 5 or 6 litre would in the 70s, and and in the case of this one, that means 200 horses and 282 foot-pounds of torque, which is around or just over 380 newton meters. So in other words, for a daily driver, it's more than enough. Now, one of the things that's always going to come into play with an American car, in fact, two things really that go hand in hand, especially on UK roads, is number one, man, that thing is massive. <laughs> So I want to talk for a second about exactly how big this car is. It's actually 211 inches long, so probably not quite as big as you might think. In fact, as I mentioned in my announcement reveal for the car, it's actually a full foot shorter than my Lincoln 
even though the Lincoln is only the two-door, showing just how massive the Continental really is, but this is also 79 inches wide, so it's actually not that crazy. I believe that's about the same as like a Mercedes S-Class or an Audi A8, and it weighs in at 1,875 kilos, which is just over 4,100 pounds. So even in terms of the weight, it's actually not that crazy. And again, to compare it to the Lincoln, a longer but also you know less seats, less doors kind of car, it weighs about half a ton less than the Lincoln does, so it's quite a lot lighter than it looks. Although I will definitely say when it comes to the driving of this car, especially compared to the Lincoln, which really is a car that spoils me because of just how good it is, this Ford very much feels like its age, whereas the Lincoln feels far beyond its years. The Lincoln still feels amazing. By today's standards, this feels like a 60s car. Although, to be fair, I will still take the handling on this over most of the other classics that I've driven. I drove a 73 Ford Cortina here on the channel in another review. I also reviewed a Mark II Jag, one of the most iconic British classics. And I'll tell you right now, the handling on this is better than both of them. <laughs> it's not as iconic and it's not necessarily as quick, but I will take the handling on this car over those any day. It's far more uh, predictable, it's far more consistent. It doesn't feel twitchy, and although it has a bit more of that floaty, kind of soft feel, it's still not a boat, and I think part of the reason why is because of the aftermarket wheels which it has. So the tyres are wider, lower profile, bigger rim, so it does ride a little bit harder and a little bit more controlled through corners. Now in terms of living with a car like this, the other question that ties into its size is what's the fuel economy? It's got a three-speed auto, it's running on a carburetor, it's about as aerodynamic as a house, so is it something that is genuinely livable? Well, actually, yeah, it kind of is. See, on the motorway, the economy on this is not bad at all. In fact, on the return trip, which was about 200 miles back for me, it cost me about 65, 66 pounds in fuel, which equates to around 22 miles per gallon. That's pretty damn good at 60 miles an hour, which of course is what this car was intended for, about 55, 60, so I'm really happy with that. In terms of week in, week out daily life, I tend to drive about 120 to 160 miles a week, generally speaking, and that'll cost me, at least for the more so 120 mile end, about 60 pounds in fuel. So that's more realistic. That's more like, what, 14 miles per gallon, which is what you'd probably more typically expect. In those kind of scenarios, that's not that great, but between 14 and 22, it's certainly livable for me. Now, the number one thing for buying an American Classic is, of course, knowing that you can maintain that kind of fuel economy, so if you don't want to be paying those kind of fuel costs, then it won't be for you. For me, I can justify it because when I make those trips, it is going somewhere to earn money. So it justifies the trip for me. If I were not in that position, then I probably wouldn't be running one <laughs> as my daily driver. And the Lincoln is far, far more thirsty on fuel than this is, so this actually seems quite frugal in comparison. Now, of course, this one, like the Lincoln, is tax and MOT exempt, although I, of course, will be continually working on it, changing things, servicing it every year, so it will still be taken good care of. And even in terms of just the mechanical comparison between this and the Lincoln, although it has a lot of things that I love, one of my favourite things about it is that it feels so different. It doesn't step on its toes, you know, they don't step on each other's toes. One is more of the low rider, this is more of the surfer dude. And in terms of driving it as well, not only is the handling much more 60s, the size of the cabin makes this car feel bigger than the Lincoln, even though it isn't. You know, it's a very large feeling car with a lot of space inside, which is great. But the biggest difference, certainly when you drive it, is the brakes. This has drums front and rear, and as far as I know, they are not servo-assisted. They are brake-by-wire, and having seen underneath the car, where you can see the wires, it looks about as effective as the V-brakes on a bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> and they certainly feel about as effective as well. Although, once again, I will say it's not that bad to live with. You're never really going that fast. The brakes are as strong as you press on them. So in my case, I can get a, a pretty decent amount of leg force going on that brake pedal when I need it. So when I have had the rare occasion of needing to slow down quickly, the car actually performs really well. Certainly for a car with drum brakes that weighs nearly two tons but it's more so just the general stopping and slowing down where the brakes aren't that good. 
you have to kind of press them fairly hard if you really want to slow down, otherwise you'll be holding the brake for quite a while as it gradually thinks about possibly stopping sometime soon. So the brakes are really the only thing that's like, mm, I might upgrade those. Aside from that though, the handling I've got used to very quickly, the car doesn't float around, it's lovely to drive, and just like with the Lincoln, everyone loves looking at a car like this. I have some plans for it, nothing too radical immediately, one of the things that I do want to do, of course, is free up some more of that sound from the engine. I'm planning on doing like a, a manual bypass pipe, like a pipe coming off of the primary pipes where I can unscrew a cap on the end or open a valve so I can have it side piped when I want it to and then going through the normal boxes when I want it to be quieter. It's those few things that I'm planning to do, but in terms of just what the car already gives you, there's so much to love. Now in comparison to the other models of Galaxy and Fairlane, the overall run of the Galaxy ran from 59 to 74, but then the Squire compared to this, the Squire being the higher level model with the wood panelling, these actually outsold those every single year that they were sold, because the Squire was more exclusive, more expensive, and a lot of people just wanted this level of kit, and I can understand why. Now, as far as the engine, as I mentioned earlier on, I would love to know if anyone can correct me on whether or not this was a similar engine, or the same block, or etc., as used in the older Mustangs. It certainly seems like it could have been. And just to return to the point of fuel economy, for those in the States who maybe don't think that those numbers sound realistic or match up, which did happen last time when I mentioned that in my initial breakdown, which is fair enough, it's because US MPG and UK MPG are different. <laughs> so in the UK, when I say that it can do 22 to the gallon highway, that's the equivalent to more like 18 in the States. So probably sounds a bit more realistic there for Americans. And then as far as me getting more like an average of about 14, 15, that's more like 12, 13. US. So that's the kind of comparison that you're looking at. Not a huge difference, but kind of like the US ton versus the UK ton, there is just a bit of difference there. Ultimately though, I am absolutely loving this car. It is definitely more primitive and more of a workhorse than the Lincoln is. No seat belts, drum brakes, you know, all of this primitive stuff. But for that, I'd love it. Like I said, I like how different it feels. I certainly don't see myself selling it anytime soon unless something goes catastrophically wrong. And the fact that it does have that much smaller, less powerful engine in what is technically a smaller and lighter car means that it kind of feels like the engine's never working that hard anyway. With the Lincoln, it has a huge amount of fuel pressure, massive engine, it's a 462 in comparison. This one, it feels like it takes everything in its stride. So yeah, I'm absolutely loving it. And of course, if you want to check out more content for this car, you can find on the channel and aside from that if you would like to hear my thoughts on other classics such as the ones that i mentioned and of course my lincoln you can find those here in the beards and cars playlist as well but for now as always thanks for watching